In London, we now take water for granted. We just turn on a tap and it's there. But there was a time when that wasn't so. I'm going to look back before Londoners had a ready and unlimited supply and then how, 400 years ago, an ingenious solution was created to bring water into people's homes, a source that over four centuries later still provides London with much of its water. London was founded by the Romans in around 43 AD. One of several reasons they chose where to establish their town of Londinium was its abundance of fresh water, which flowed from the surrounding hills to the north to reach the Thames, or came out of the ground in nearby springs. In some places, a well could be dug into gravel beds, perhaps connected to a communal pump. For the Romans, the closest of these streams was the Walbrook, which ran right through the centre of their city, along what is now the street of the same name. The largest river immediately close to Londinium that flowed down to the Thames from the north was the Fleet, the source of which is springs here at Hampstead Heath. As London expanded, the Fleet flowed through the western side of the conurbation, but, like London's other streams, it was gradually covered over. But it's still there, and if you listen carefully, there are places where you can hear it flowing beneath your feet, such as through this grating in Clerkenwell. During the Middle Ages, Londoners used water for cooking and cleaning and occasionally laundry, but the medieval inhabitants of the city rarely washed themselves. They were unlikely to drink water, and it's no wonder because they used the fleet and the other streams to wash away their waste, and that included their human and animal waste, so the fleet became increasingly polluted and unusable as a source of water. It's no wonder that people drank beer rather than water. This is Clerkenwell, just to the north of the city. During the Middle Ages, this was countryside outside of the city, and as you can guess from the name, it was where a well was located. It supplied the area's monasteries and convents with their water, and the well remained in use right through to the 19th century. It must have been a place of entertainment for Londoners, because the city's parish clerks would come to the well to perform plays, and thus it became known as Clark's Well. Incredibly, the well is still preserved below an office building, The springs, streams and wells that brought London its fresh water gradually became insufficient to provide all the needs, so conduits or water pipes were constructed to bring supplies from sources outside the city walls. One of the first of these was the Great Conduit, built in the 13th century during the reign of King Henry III. The Great Conduit took water from the River Tyburn, which was to the west of the city, to Cheapside in the heart of medieval London. You can see the conduit at Cheapside in this engraving from the early 17th century. Ever more conduits were created to bring water from springs outside of London, from Paddington, Finsbury, Highgate and Hackney. In the 15th century, the City of London acquired a rural area just to the west that contained springs from which they could bring water. Conduit Street in Mayfair was later laid out on that land. This is Lamb's Conduit Street. It's a reminder that during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, the wealthy cloth merchant and philanthropist William Lamb paid a large sum of money to create a pipe that brought fresh water from the River Fleet along here and down to Holborn. An ancient sign incorporated into the side wall of a modern building is a reminder of the old conduit. William Lamb also paid for buckets that allowed 120 poor women to distribute and sell the water. You didn't have to go to a conduit yourself to fetch your water. For the convenience of busy and more affluent Londoners, water was sold by tankard bearers who walked the streets delivering it in large flasks. In 1581, a Dutch or German-born engineer by the name of Peter Moritz gave a demonstration to London's mayor and alderman of a water wheel turned by the flow of the tide that could pump Thames water to a great height. His plan was that, having raised the water up into a water tower, it could then flow down through pipes to homes and workshops. The experiment was successful, and the city granted him a 500-year lease on the northern arch of London Bridge, under which he installed his water wheel. River water was pumped up into a tower and down through lead pipes into the city. You can see the water tower in this drawing by the artist Canaletto. For a price, householders and businesses could tap into Moritz's pipes for their supplies. Business must have been brisk, because Moritz expanded into a second arch and then a third. 
Finally, an arch was added at the southern end of the bridge to supply Southwark. Moritz paid the city an annual fee and from the beginning had the support of the city corporation, an important point that will become relevant later in this story. Moritz died a wealthy man and his family continued to profit from the enterprise for the next century. But the river has always been somewhat muddy and strong tides occasionally brought salty seawater upriver, so I doubt that water from the waterworks was actually drinkable. The water wheels only worked for a short period each day either side of high tide and his waterworks was only capable of supplying those in the streets in the immediate vicinity of the bridge. Londoners further away couldn't be supplied and there were regular complaints to the mayor about the lack of water. But they had to wait another two or three decades for a solution. This is the New River. It has been said many times, but let me say it again. It is not new, and it is not a river. Yet in the early 17th century, it began to supply much of London's fresh water. In the 1590s, a former soldier by the name of Edmund Colthurst had the idea of bringing fresh water to London from springs at both Chadwell and Amwell. So I went looking for Chadwell Springs, which lie between the towns of Hartford and Ware in Hertfordshire, and these days are dominated by the A10 road bridge. Colthurst's plan was to bring the water to London from here by digging what he called a river, but was actually a man-made channel, a distance of around 22 miles or 34 kilometres in a straight line from the springs to the city. Such a scheme would require some kind of official approval, so Colthurst petitioned Queen Elizabeth, but she died before a royal charter could be granted. So he tried again with her successor, King James. Colthurst argued the benefits to the City of London, saying that much of the water would be freely provided for cleansing, scouring and keeping sweet diverse foul and unsavoury ditches in and about our said cities of London and Westminster, which at this present are of very great annoyance and a cause often times of sickness. In other words, to clean the drains. And the rest was to be provided by way of pipes to homes and businesses who would pay for a supply of water. The offer to clean the drains and prevent sickness was a timely argument because the previous year around 30,000 Londoners had died of a plague. How could the king refuse? So in 1604, Colthurst gained a charter from the king for his river. Having successfully gained the charter, Colthurst began negotiations with landowners along the route. By 1605, a channel six feet wide and three miles long had been dug from Chadwell towards London. But then the work stopped. Colthurst probably ran out of money to continue the work because he then tried to persuade the City of London Corporation to contribute to the costs. The City's Common Council considered the issue and in the meantime no further work took place for four years. But during that time the City decided to apply to Parliament for an act to develop the scheme themselves. Parliament agreed so long as Colthurst was to be compensated for any loss he had suffered. Coulter still wanted to press ahead with the enterprise and negotiated with the city corporation, proposing they could take two-thirds of the water supply if they funded two-thirds of the cost of the channel. The city declined the proposal and the idea of supplying water to clean the drains was quietly forgotten. Instead, to fund the scheme and carry out the work, the city corporation assigned its right to Hugh Middleton, one of the city's common councillors who had taken part in debates about the issue. Middleton was a city goldsmith, effectively a banker. He was the son of the governor of Denbigh Castle in Wales and somewhat of an entrepreneur with investments in silver and coal mines and land reclamation. Middleton was part of a distinguished family. His brother Thomas was knighted and served as Lord Mayor of London. Both Sir Thomas and another brother, Robert, sat as MPs in Parliament for the City of London. Middleton may not be a household name these days, but the Victorians obviously held him in high regard, commemorating him with one of four statues of eminent London characters on each corner of Holborn Viaduct, and another on the side of the Royal Exchange in the heart of the city, and yet another within Islington Town Hall. There are several streets named after him along the route of the New River. A pub in Islington, and also a school at Clerkenwell. But wait, did you notice there are two different spellings of his name? That's because Middleton lived at a time before spelling had become consistent and even he, like William Shakespeare, spelt his name in different ways. Here's a statue of Middleton on Islington Green, very close to where the New River passed in the time before it was piped underground. It was unveiled in 1862 by the Chancellor of the Exchequer and future Prime Minister William Gladstone. 
So Middleton took over the project from Colthurst and received the glory and the profits. In the meantime, Edmund Colthurst, who had initiated the plan for his river and undertook much of the work, has remained largely forgotten. Unlike Middleton, there are no statues to Colthurst, and it has only been in recent years that he has been remembered in the form of several street names along the route he planned. Work resumed in 1609. Middleton negotiated with landowners through which it would pass, while he employed Edmund Colthurst to oversee the labourers. The width of Colthurst's initial channel had been six feet, but Middleton had it enlarged to ten feet. By the middle of 1610, ten miles was complete, before work was halted once again and the workmen laid off. This time it was because some of the landowners along the route were refusing to allow the channel to pass through their property. Middleton then approached King James and offered him a half share of the profits in the venture in return for providing half the costs. At that time the king was having political issues and was happy to find new streams of income that did not rely on Parliament, so was happy to take up the offer. The king issued a proclamation that nobody was to molest, trouble or hinder the said Hugh Middleton in bringing the said springs to the City of London upon pain of His Majesty's high displeasure. This statement by King James became a useful protection for the new river. With the king on board, opposition from landowners along the route melted away and work began again. By the summer of 1612, there were 300 men working on the project. The new river was an engineering triumph of its time. Much of the credit must go to Edmund Colthurst, the man who initiated the scheme, and seemed to have planned the route and overseen the construction work. But Middleton also employed very talented mathematicians and navigators as surveyors, probably to plot some of the finer details. I met with Rachel MacDonald of the New River Action Group, who provided some details of the New River in its early days. The New River, when it was created in 1613, was just over 40 miles long. It flowed downhill from Ware in Hertfordshire to Islington on the edge of the City of London quite slowly. Um, on a, gr a very imperceptible gradient, which is noticeable today, five inches per mile. Um, as originally conceived by Edmund Coulters back in 1602 and faithfully carried out by, his, by Hugh Middleton's new surveyor, um, Edward Wright, uh, a young genius who happened to be uh, the maths teacher of Prince Henry. Um, so James I probably had a hand in that. It followed the 100-foot contour the whole way, which is why it's such a long, circuitous route. Middleton had to pay compensation to everyone whose land the new river passed over. The vicar of Amwell, however, waived payment because it was good for his native London. Middleton responded by gifting a copy of the newly printed King James Bible to the parish of Amwell, and later left the parish some money in his will. The Act of Parliament imposed a duty on Middleton to provide 157 convenient bridges and ways for the passage of the King's subjects and their cattle and carriages over or through the said new cut or river. This is Islington, just to the north of the City of London. Although you'd never know it today, it's actually situated on a ridge perched above the valley formed by the River Fleet. Until the early 19th century, it was a favourite spot for Londoners to visit from where they could view the whole of London and beyond. And this is what it looked like from the top of the hill 250 or so years ago. Middleton's new river flowed down from Hertfordshire and after a winding course of 40 miles it reached the top of Islington Hill. It then ran down the hill to a pond or reservoir made from a former duck pond which was renamed New River Head. Here, water could not only be stored until needed, but the reservoir also provided a head of water pressure that allowed it to pass through pipes into the city. A small building known as the Water House was built on the edge of the pond. To leave the reservoir, water passed under the house and it was there that the flow could be regulated. This drawing was made by the artist Wenceslaus Holler in 1665 while the Great Plague was raging through London. In the distance beyond the Waterhouse you can see the old St Paul's Cathedral as it was before being destroyed in the Great Fire of London the following year. Work on the New River was completed in September 1613. 
On the 29th of that month, Hugh Middleton led a procession out from the city to New River Head. With him were the Lord Mayor, his brothers Thomas and Robert, and 60 of the workmen wearing their best clothes and special green caps. They were led by a drummer and trumpeter. It was a special moment for the Middletons because on the same day Thomas was elected as the next Lord Mayor. The well-known but unrelated playwright Thomas Middleton also attended and wrote a long verse describing the occasion. After the reciting of a verse, praising the efforts of the workers, the floodgates were opened and water gushed into the pond to the sound of triumphant trumpets, drums and cannons. In one way, King James may have regretted his backing for the New River. These ruins are all that is left of his country palace of Theobalds near Chesant in Hertfordshire. Most of the palace was demolished in the 1650s after James's son, King Charles I, was executed by parliamentarians. James had allowed the New River to pass through the grounds of Theobalds Palace. But while out riding there with Prince Charles one cold winter morning in January 1622, James was thrown by his horse. He crashed through the ice that covered the new river and had to be pulled out of the freezing water. When the water supply finally reached London, it was piped from the new river head at Islington into the city, into city premises, uh, by the means of elm pipes. The elm trunks were hollowed out by a special device uh, invented for that purpose. Uh, sharpened at one end like a giant pencil and hollowed out at the other so they all fitted in uh, to get it very nicely. Though not perfectly, they were a bit leaky. Uh, the amount of money that, the, that was paid by various premises varied terrifically depending what sort of premises they were. The water supply wasn't continuous though. It was only for two or three hours a day, and never on a Sunday. And it was turned on and off by gentlemen who were called turncocks. In the early days, Middleton ran the operation from his home to where customers would come to pay for their supply. But there was a reluctance for Londoners to sign up for Middleton's water. Water pressure wasn't high enough to rise up into buildings, so it could only be supplied to premises with a basement. I can also imagine that those who could actually afford it had servants who had always fetched water from a conduit or a parish pump, and why would they pay to simply make their servants' lives easier? That was quite a problem for Middleton. He had personally invested a very large amount in the venture. He had also persuaded the king to pay half the costs, and James expected a return on his investment. So as early as 1612, Middleton sold shares in the New River to raise funds. An enterprise such as the New River was still quite unusual at the time and there were few precedents on which its funding could be based. But a new concept was evolving. Joint stock companies. The Royal Exchange had opened in the centre of London and it was a place where merchants could congregate to buy or exchange goods, make deals with one another and trade shares in joint stock companies. London's merchants were starting to finance long-distance voyages of discovery to other parts of the world. They were expensive to undertake and risky. If vessels were sent out laden with valuable cargoes but never seen again, it could financially ruin the owners of a ship. So those carrying out these ventures invited aristocrats and other wealthy individuals to invest in a voyage. Each investor purchased a share in a joint stock company and in that way spread both the risk and the reward. The earliest of London's joint stock companies was formed in the 1550s to fund a voyage to find a new northern sea route to the Far East. They failed in their initial objective, but it led to the establishment of the Muscovy Company, which traded with Russia and the Baltic. Fifty years later, at the very time Edmund Colthurst was planning his water channel, a much more significant and successful company was formed. The first voyage of the East India Company set sail from the Thames in 1601 and went on to become for a time the world's greatest trading company. The number of customers for New River Water gradually increased and by 1616 there were slightly over a thousand paying customers. It was still not enough to make the venture profitable and there was therefore need for additional funds, but at least there was cause for optimism. Middleton then followed the lead provided by the East India Company and others by creating a joint stock operation to bring new investors and finance into the venture. 
The Charter of Incorporation, granted by King James in 1619 to the New River Company brought from Chadwell and Amwell to London, stipulated that no new supplies of water could be brought into the city, Westminster or Southwark, without permission of the company. Clearly, the king intended to safeguard his investment. 36 shares were issued at £100 each, plus a contribution to the cost of construction. Thus, the New River Company became one of the early pioneers of what in modern times would be considered as a publicly traded company. Middleton kept some shares for himself and his family, and others were sold to wealthy and eminent people. Four shares were given to Edmund Colthurst for his initial contribution, although it took some time for the company to yield profits, and Colthurst died before he could receive any dividends. You'll also remember that King James had a right to half the profits. He died in 1625, and his son and successor, Charles, inherited the royal portion of the shares. But Charles, always in financial difficulties, sold his half back to Middleton. That isn't surprising. King Charles is remembered as someone with a history of making bad decisions. Indeed, it led him to being the only English monarch to have ever been put on trial and beheaded. One of his mistakes was to sell his shares back to Middleton. It may have seemed like a good deal at the time, but the New River Company was to become a hugely profitable business that for the following 250 years and more would pay out huge dividends to shareholders. There's plenty more to come, but please remember to like and subscribe and check my YouTube channel for other videos about London's history. This is the River Lee, which passes through Hertfordshire and then down the east side of London until it flows into the Thames. From the source of the New River, and for quite some distance, both the Lee and the New River flow in parallel through the Lee Valley. In all the various acts and charters that authorised the New River, Edmund Colthurst and Hugh Middleton were forbidden to take water from the Lee. But Middleton must have soon realised that water from the springs at Chadwell and Amwell was insufficient for the company's needs, and despite the charters, he cut a channel from the Lee to divert water into the new river. In those days, the Lee was an important river along which barges carried corn and malt down to London, and the bargees soon objected to this siphoning of water. King James appointed commissioners to investigate, and in 1619 an agreement was reached for Middleton to extract a daily amount of water from the Lee, which has remained the main source of the New River's water ever since. This is the Gage House. It was built by the New River Company in 1856 to control the amount of water extracted from the Lee. The largest part of what flows along the New River still comes from here. And this machinery beside the gauge house still ensures that no more than 102 million litres, or 22.5 million gallons, passes from the Lee to the New River each day. The board of the New River Company initially met in various places, including the homes of its shareholders, or in coffee houses. In 1693, a boardroom, then known as the courtroom, was added into the water house at New River Head. It was a beautiful room with oak panelling in the style of the famous woodcarver Grinling Gibbons. And it still exists. Much of the plastering on the ceiling is on a watery theme, with a painting in the centre of King William III, the monarch when the room was created, wearing armour. And within the plaster ceiling is Hugh Middleton's coat of arms. The water house was eventually replaced, but the courtroom was preserved and incorporated within the new building, and it became known as the Oak Room. That successor building was itself replaced by this building at New River Head, the headquarters of the Metropolitan Water Board, which we'll come back to later. And once again, the Oak Room was moved and preserved. The office building is now a residential apartment block, but the Oak Room still remains in place within it. The New River Company initially served the more northerly parts of the City of London, the districts not serviced by the London Bridge Waterworks. But London was expanding and its population growing in size. New suburbs were being created to house this growing population on what had previously been the surrounding fields and market gardens. Supplying new districts such as Covent Garden, St James's and Soho was a considerable challenge for the New River Company. The distance from New River Head to the western suburbs was quite far and the gradient from the reservoir there not enough to provide sufficient water pressure for anything more than a dribble of water. 
In around 1700, the company asked Sir Christopher Wren if he could suggest a solution. That he did, but the company seems to have ignored his proposals, as well as other less practical solutions brought forward. Instead, they decided on a scheme devised by George Sorokold. Sorokold was a prolific water engineer who had already gained a reputation for creating docks and waterworks around the country, including improved water wheels for London Bridge. His solution was to create an additional reservoir at a higher level, known as the Upper Pond, which provided sufficient pressure to carry supply to the west side of the conurbation. The Upper Pond was dug on pastures used by Henry Hanking for feeding animals. Hanking was the owner of the Angel Inn, from where passengers travelling out of London along the Great North Road would start their journey and, to this day, gives the area its name. Here's a cartoon of the Angel Inn, drawn by the artist William Hogarth. To compensate Hanking for the loss of some of his pasture land, the New River Company agreed to pay him an annual fee and to supply the Angel Inn with free water. The challenge Sorokold faced was that the channel bringing the water from Hertfordshire came to New River Head and seems to have not easily been redirected to the upper pond. This he overcame by pumping water uphill from the old reservoir to the new. To achieve it, he had a unique type of windmill built that acted as a pump, which was unusual in having six sails. For times when there was no wind, it could be worked by horses walking around the base. Sorokold's windmill began working in 1708, but was never a great success. Its sails had a tendency to blow off in high winds. The windmill was soon replaced by an adjacent building, in which the horses worked a pumping engine. By 1726, when the writer Daniel Defoe described the new river system, he wrote, This higher basin they fill from the lower, by a great engine worked formerly with six sails, now by many horses constantly working. In later years, horsepower was replaced by a steam engine. The windmill stood for many years thereafter, but without its sails, and more than 300 years later, its base can still be seen. Now I digress. Until the middle of the 18th century, if you wanted to cross the Thames without taking a boat, you had to go over London Bridge, but it was very narrow and always congested. The bridge was owned by the City of London, who always objected to any proposals to build additional crossings. But the government went over the city's heads and in 1750 opened Westminster Bridge beside the Houses of Parliament. The City Corporation were shamed into action and opened a competition to design a new bridge between the outlet of the River Fleet at Blackfriars and Southwark on the South Bank. All the eminent architects of the time submitted designs. But to everyone's surprise, the successful entry came from an unknown 26-year-old Scot by the name of Robert Milne, who had never built anything of significance. He was then contracted to build the bridge, and Blackfriars Bridge was successfully completed in 1769. Milne continued with a distinguished career, following in the footsteps of Sir Christopher Wren as the surveyor of St Paul's Cathedral, appointed by no less than the Archbishop of Canterbury. It was a position he held for the rest of his long life. During his time at St Paul's, he was responsible for the creation of Sir Christopher Wren's tombstone, many years after the great architect's death, as well as organising the funeral of Admiral Lord Nelson. In both cases, famous phrases were included in their memorials. Robert was himself buried close to Wren in the cathedral when he died in 1810. It was necessary for the New River Company to bring large amounts of elm tree trunks into London for their pipes, and they came along the Thames on barges. To unload and store the trunks, they opened an office and yard at the point where the river fleet flowed out into the Thames. In this painting from around 1750 by the artist Samuel Scott, you can make out their yard and the tree trunks piled up. Milne's work on Blackfriars Bridge involved alterations to the New River Company's office beside the river fleet. And so, in the 1760s, began a relationship between the Milne family and the New River that was to last for at least four generations and well into the 20th century. Alongside his work at St Paul's Cathedral, Robert was engaged by the New River Company as its engineer for over 50 years. He purchased a small estate on the side of the New River at Amwell, where he designed and built a substantial house as a weekend retreat, which still stands as a family home. 
Close by is the village church of St John the Baptist, where Robert Milne's grandson later became the rector. Robert's wife Mary died shortly after the house at Amwell was completed, so he designed a tomb for her in the churchyard, and I went along to take a look. Another member of the family who would later be buried in the vault at Amwell was their son, William Chadwell Milne. During his life, William Chadwell Milne was a highly successful engineer, working on waterworks from Birmingham to Paris and Hamburg. At the same time, he also succeeded his father at the New River Company, and in turn, both of William's sons followed him at the company. By the early 19th century, the conurbation of London had spread as far north as Islington and surrounded New River Head. The company was therefore sitting on what had become valuable land. So they laid out streets on what had previously been pasture land, and plots were then leased to individual builders to erect the dwellings. But William Chadwell Milne kept strict control of their quality and ensured a mostly uniform design. 600 houses were built to provide homes for 5,000 people, together with a school, shops and pubs. Several of the streets were named after Hugh Middleton and the Milne family, and the sources of the New River. In the heart of the development was Middleton Square, with St Mark's Church, designed by William Chadwell Milne, in its centre. The New River estate was no doubt a pleasant suburb when completed in the 1820s, but a century later it had declined into an impoverished district. But that situation changed again in the latter part of the 20th century, as people sought well-built family homes close to the centre of London. As the population of London continued to grow, and an increasing number of premises installed flushing toilets, there was ever more demand for supply of the New River Company's water. To keep an increased reserve, William Chadwell Milne had two reservoirs created at Stoke Newington in North London, which are still in place today. The ancient London Bridge, the foundations of which dated back to the 12th century, was at that time being replaced, finally bringing to an end the old London Bridge waterworks that had served parts of the City of London and Southwark for 250 years. It is said that Milne was then able to acquire the materials of the old bridge to line the banks of his new reservoirs. No longer an important part of London's water supply, one of the reservoirs is now used for sailboating and all year round swimming. And the other reservoir is now a nature reserve, opened by Sir David Attenborough in 2016. A former sluice house at the nature reserve is now a cafe, and a plaque on the site still recalls that the reservoirs were completed by Milne in 1833. From the 1830s until the 1860s, London suffered a series of outbreaks of cholera in which tens of thousands of people died. The success of the New River Company and the expanding suburbs of London encouraged the formation of new water companies in different areas. The cholera outbreaks were at least partly because many of these companies were taking their supply from the heavily polluted River Thames. Yet until the second half of the 19th century, the general opinion was that cholera was carried through the air rather than by water. But as this cartoon from Punch magazine shows, it was clear to everyone that the Thames was heavily polluted and that taking drinking water from the river was a bad idea. In 1855, for example, the Times newspaper published a letter by the scientist Michael Faraday about the pollution, following which Punch magazine produced this cartoon of him presenting his card to the rather foul Father Thames. In response to the growing understanding about polluted water, in 1852 the government passed the Metropolis Water Act. This stipulated that the companies could no longer extract from the tidal Thames and that water had to be cleansed by filtration. In response, the New River Company created the filter beds at New River Head you can see here in this picture, with gravel brought by barge down the River Lee from Ware in Hertfordshire as well as sand from Harwich. Filter beds were also created close to the reservoirs at Stoke Newington. Filtered water from there was separated out from the openly flowing New River and pumped through pipes to the upper pond at New River Head, which was converted into a covered reservoir built of 4 million bricks and holding 3.5 million gallons of water. This is what the reservoir looked like as work was being carried out in 1856, and it's still in use today. 
A huge pumping station was constructed beside the reservoirs at Stoke Newington to pump the filtered water through the pipes. Inside the building were six great steam engines that looked something like these ones at Lambeth Waterworks. The pumping station at Stoke Newington is still in place and is one of London's strangest buildings. It was designed by William Chadwell Milne in the style of a Scottish castle, but almost every part of it had a particular function. The buttresses that appear to support the building are actually hollow to provide space as the huge flywheels of the beam engines spun around. Milne even managed to include monograms on the side of the building in gold lettering stating Milne, 1855. The building served its original purpose for a hundred years and these days is used as an indoor climbing centre known as the Castle. The Metropolis Water Act brought about a rapid improvement in the quality of London's water. In 1856, the General Board of Health was able to report that the decrease of organic matter since the analysis in 1851 is very remarkable in the water of all the companies. This result is obviously due to the alteration of the localities from which the supply of water is derived, as well as the improvements made in the collection, filtration and the general management of the water. The New River has been considerably shortened over the years, particularly in the Victorian era, when 10 miles were removed, uh, the loops were cut out which had been necessary for the 100 foot contour route and that allowed for building up Victorian suburbs when the land uh, finally dried out. But some interesting bits are left as ornamental water features along the route, particularly Enfield Town. But now the 40 mile New River has shrunk to a mere 28 miles long. During 1985, it was learned that Thames Water Authority, who at that time uh, owned the uh, New River, intended shortening it again, but this time actually cutting it off south of Turkey Street in Enfield, meaning most of London would lose the New River. The wonderful green corridor and its abundant wildlife would disappear forever. The New River Action Group sort of came together gradually throughout 85 and 86 and lobbied Parliament to ensure this didn't happen. The lobbying was successful, Parliament disallowed the plan and we still today have this wonderful amenity. The New River Action Group has continued uh, to monitor developments along the New River and was successful in time for the millennium uh, in uh, 2000 in getting the New River path opened for walkers so that almost the entire length of the New River can now be walked and enjoyed by everyone. A section of the New River that was piped underground in the 20th century was here at Clissold Park at Stoke Newington. You can just about make out where it ran along here and through this sluice house that is now a small coffee shop but a short section remains as an ornamental pond. I met up with local expert Amir Dotan to learn more about it. I'm going to talk a bit about the history of the park and also a bit about the history of the, the New River that is a main feature of the park. Um, this is what's left of it today. Uh, in fact, this is an ornamental pond um, that's not linked to the original New River. When the New River opened in 1613 to bring fresh drinking water from Hertfordshire to London, this was all open land. Uh, Stoke Newington back then was just a very small rural village um, four miles um, outside London. So in 1790, a local banker named Jonathan Hoare, he actually grew up in a house on Church Street, just opposite what uh, later became the park. He wanted to have a house built, so picked a nice location in this open space. Interestingly, further away from, from the street, so it wasn't actually facing Church Street like all the other mansions that were here at the time. Um, so he got the freehold for the area where the house was built. He leased all the land that was surrounded by the New River. Uh, so he leased that from the church commissioners that owned the land and that became his front garden. Um, unfortunately, he ran into financial difficulties and only a few years later, around 1800, he had to uh, sell the house. And then it went through the ownership of several people, including the local curate, Reverend Augustus Clissold and his wife Eliza. But the church commissioners eventually put the land on the market. 
And at the time, in 1886, uh, all of Stoke Newington was built up and this was the last remaining open space and it was at real risk of being built on and turned into just rows and rows of houses like all the other open spaces around it by the early 1880s. And that really when a local campaign started, uh, spearheaded by Joseph Back and John Runtz, they were very alarmed by the prospect of losing this open space. And they started lobbying initially the Metropolitan Board of Works to purchase the park for the public. And it was a two-year process of ending up lobbying other bodies, local parishes, to donate the money. And eventually it opened to the public on the 24th of July, 1889. Uh, and it's been a public park Park ever since. Originally the New River terminated in Sellers Wells in Islington but uh, in 1946 it was shortened to end at the East Reservoir. Now interestingly there was still a section left in the park. Um, from what I was able to research and find out the entire section along Church Street was drained and filled in in 1958 and what we're left with today is really an ornamental crescent pond uh, where the new river used to be um, if you look at it it's it's not deep it's standing water it's not flowing anywhere uh, my understanding is that it's just it's, it's fed from from a pipe potentially running in a loop so it's it's where the new river was but it's not actually connected to the the real new river that still supplies about 10 percent of london's water supply which is quite quite amazing stoke newington which is now part of the london borough of hackney has a fascinating history and you can find out more about it by checking out amir's website at stokenewingtonhistory.com These days you can still find various places between Stoke Newington and Islington where the New River flowed before disappearing from sight, such as here at Petherton Road. And this linear park in the heart of Islington was created where it once passed through. When the New River first came through here, it was a rural area of farmland and cottages. Then around 150 years later, in the mid-18th century, the landowner, Sir George Colebrook, leased land to house builders, and the part of the street on the east side is still named Colebrook Row. The houses on the west side of the New River came later and were named after Admiral Duncan, the commander in a naval battle against the Dutch. So there were then two separate streets, each with a terrace of housing facing the New River flowing between them. But then in 1861, the New River was piped underground. Colebrook Row and Duncan Terrace thus became two sides of one street, but still retained their old names. One street, two names. The house at the northern end of Duncan Terrace is older than the others around here, and dates back to a time when it was still countryside, with the New River flowing right outside. In the 1860s, it was occupied by the poet Charles Lamb, who entertained other writers here. Who knows why, but on one occasion one of the guests departed from the house in the wrong direction, and ended up in the New River. If we walk down this path from Colebrook Terrace, we find a particularly interesting feature. In the early 19th century, the Regent's Canal was created to link up the new Thames dock systems on the east side of London with the Grand Junction Canal that ran up to the English Midlands. It would have been impossible to take the canal over Islington Hill, so a tunnel was bored through it. But the canal then had to somehow pass the much older New River, so it was made at a level that passed under the New River, emerging at Colebrook Terrace. From the beginning, the New River Company had faced competition from the London Bridge Waterworks. But as I've already mentioned, as London expanded, several other small localised competitors came into being from the late 17th century. The York Buildings Waterworks was formed in 1691 and pumped its water from the Thames to supply the local area. It was located where Charing Cross Station now stands and its water tower was for a long time a distinctive feature on the riverside. The Chelsea Waterworks began operating from 1723. It had special permission from the monarchy to use the ponds in St James's Park and Hyde Park as reservoirs. More London water companies came into being as London expanded, and after 200 years, the increasing competition forced the New River Company to finally make changes. They replaced their elm pipes with less leaky iron ones that could withstand a higher pressure. That allowed water to be supplied continuously and to upper floors of premises and not just basements. 
To learn more about how London's water supply developed as time progressed, I met up with Nick Hyam, a man who has written a wonderfully readable book about the subject that I thoroughly recommend. We met at Amwell, close to the source of the New River. I began by asking Nick about the New River Company's competitors that gradually came into being. London was growing in the 18th century and the New River couldn't supply all of it, so a series of new water companies started up along the, the, the River Thames, especially to the west. But come the beginning of the 19th century, uh, a whole group of new water companies came into being, they all got Acts of Parliament, which took a new approach. Instead of just trying to supply the expanding London metropolis, which they were doing, they also decided that they would compete with the existing water companies, the New River Company foremost among them. Uh, what they hadn't realised, what we now know, is that water is actually a natural monopoly and it makes no sense for more than one company to try and supply a single neighbourhood. But they found that out the hard way. And there was a period of about five or six years known as London's Water Wars, when the companies fought tooth and nail, two, three in each area, competing for customers. And it was a disaster. Nobody made any money. Uh, there were lots and lots of dirty tricks, customers playing one company off against another. Uh, and the Regency businessmen who'd started these companies thought they were very clever and they weren't. And at the end of it, they all came to a, a secret agreement and they carved the city up between them so that London ended up eventually with just eight private water companies and each was a little local monopoly. And when they'd done the carve up, what did they do? They put their prices up by 25% and the consumers were absolutely furious. What happened in the 1820s, after the carve-up, after the private water companies had agreed secretly not to compete with one another, uh, a consumer campaign grew up and the consumers were furious about two things. One was the fact that prices had gone up and because competition no longer existed, uh, people had no alternative but to pay whatever the water companies asked. And the other problem was that there were complaints really serious complaints about the quality of the water because most of it came out of the Thames. The New River was an exception here, but most of it came out of the Thames and the Thames was basically the repository for all of London's sewage. And so it was filthy and the water was disgusting. And what you see developing over the course of the 19th century, beginning in the 1820s through the 1830s, 40s, 50s, is a steadily increasing campaign saying, look, leaving something as vital as water supply, so important to the public uh, as water supply, in the hands of private companies who are bound to put the interests of their shareholders first, that's a very bad idea. Shouldn't we be taking these companies into public ownership? The politics uh, of the public ownership of water is quite interesting because first of all in the 19th century there was a belief that private water companies were the private property of their shareholders and it was not the gov job of government to interfere in anybody's private property. That was a really, really deep-seated view shared by almost everybody in the political world. That was chipped away in 1852 when the government passed the first Metropolis Water Act, which for the first time gave the water companies instructions about what they could and could not do, even though they were privately owned. But then you had the problem, once you'd overcome that, gradually it, uh, it, it was accepted that maybe ownership by some sort of public body would be a good idea, but it took a very long time to happen because it would have been very expensive. Uh, it, 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 the shareholders needed to be bought out uh, and uh, who was going to pay for that? And then uh, the, the, the problem was what public body should take over the water companies? All sorts of ideas were canvassed. None of them came to fruition until finally at the end of the 19th century, the Metropolitan Water Board was created and took over the companies and began supplying London's water finally, eventually, in 1904. And that worked pretty well for about half a century. But then in the 1960s and 70s, not only in London, but uh, across the country, uh, publicly owned water suppliers began to find that they 
weren't allowed to borrow the money that they needed to invest to improve their infrastructure. This was going, their borrowings were going to go on the public sector borrowing requirement. Governments of the time were trying to keep public sector borrowing down. And so they kept the water companies, the water authorities, very short of money. And in the 1980s, the solution for this devised by the Thatcher government was to privatise them. The argument was we in the public, we in government don't want to underwrite the necessary borrowings to make the investments and investment by the stage really badly needed. All the kind of 19th century pipes and mains and so on were, were you know, hopeless. They, they were all out of date. They all needed replacing. We in government are not prepared to come up with the money, but maybe the private sector will. And so they devised a system under which privatised water companies across the country would be regulated and effectively controlled by a, 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 an organisation called Ofwat and Ofwat would ensure both that consumers got the service they deserved at an affordable price and the shareholders in these new companies uh, were able to make a decent return on their investment and there would be lots of money for uh, investment in new plant. Worked very well for about 10 years and then the shareholders in these companies realised they could gain the system and started extracting enormous amounts of dividends from the water companies, loading them up with borrowings and not making the investments that were needed. Thames Water is now the company that supplies water and manages sewage in London and the Thames Valley. As Britain's largest water utility, it supplies water to nearly 10 million people. But in recent years, there's been a great deal of criticism of its performance. Thames Water has been accused of not investing enough to replace old water mains, resulting in some serious bursts and flooding, and in failing to enlarge the sewer network to prevent untreated sewage flowing into rivers. Increasingly, Thames Water was playing catch-up, borrowing large amounts of money to improve the system. In 2023, the company found itself in serious financial trouble, with huge debts that in part were caused by previous owners paying themselves large dividends instead of investing in the network. In the meantime, Ofwat was accused of sleeping on the job and allowing the situation to develop. But more than 400 years after it was created by Edmund Colthurst and Hugh Middleton, the new river continues to flow from Hertfordshire and through the suburbs of North London and it still contributes much of London's water supply. Thanks for watching and I hope you've enjoyed it. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out other London history episodes on my channel. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter and find many articles about London's history on my website. Bye for now.